Good evening. You're listening to Mothman Podcast. And so I hope you're going to like tonight's episode. We're going back into the to our vault tonight, and we're going to be uh, pulling out some of the old radio shows from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. Uh, you've heard about the wishing well. Well, this is the witching well. So we'll get right to it, and I hope you like tonight's episode. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. If there ever was a country of myth and legend, it's the Emerald Isle, that precious gem that adorns the restless sea, Ireland. But for all its gay and infectious beauty, its green fields and the riot of colored flowers, there is a darker side that haunts this shining isle. Not all the mythical spirits are as captivating as leprechauns or as gentle as the fairy folk. The Celtic gods of olden times still lurk in the shadow of the woods, the deep mountain glens, the black velvet night. This man swam across the Irish Sea? Ah, not man, sir. Sure, he was more than man. A bogart or a god or whatever you'd like to call him. And evil as a raven. Cardinal as he was, so no ship or house could hold him. And his heart as black as the pits of hell. Our mystery drama, The Witching Well, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht and Carol Titel. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff. The Sinus Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You're listening to Mothman Radio. One of the Radio. basic pagan worships in any land is the adoration of water. From the beginning of man, the well has been a shrine, a symbol of life to be propitiated by sacrifice and prayer. If not the well itself, the gods or devils or guardians of its sacred content. So now let us join Patrick Kinsella of Boston, fourth generation Irish, as he starts unwittingly on a trip which will take him back to his family roots and beyond them to a brooding, misty, foreboding past. A past where timeless spirits stir and live again. Thank the Lord you're not your father's son. And what does that mean? I meant only that you take after your mother's side of the family. Oh, my mother, I hope not. I remind you that you're talking about my daughter. I'm I'm sorry, Uncle F. I I didn't mean to hurt you. It's just that mother was so cold and withdrawn and well, I don't know, bitter. Well, whatever she was, your father made her that way. With his womanizing and his extravagance and his drinking. That's not true. He was only driven to that because... God, in the name of heaven, would you leave him alone to lie dead in peace? And mother, too. Yeah. I'm glad you have some regard for her. I do, Uncle, I do. It's just that somehow we... Well, we were never close, like... Like you and Michael. Well, Lord knows he loved you. The one unselfish passion he ever had, I suppose. Does that complete the formalities concerning Father's will? Oh, no, just uh, one more thing. This. Well, what is it? <laughs> An envelope, obviously, sealed. About its contents, I know nothing. Oh, is it? Is it all right to open it? It's addressed to you. <clears throat> well, 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 why are you hesitating? I don't know, hunch. Just a feeling. What sort of feeling? Well, that maybe this should... should die with him, that it's something better left alone. <laughs> You know me, Uncle. Oh, yes. You were a strange and wonderful little boy, I have to remember. When I was younger and a little more full of sap and vigor, I used to call you the changeling. <laughs> I wouldn't have been a bit surprised to find your ears growing into points. You seem to be aware of so much beyond us stiff-necked old Yankees. Yeah. I remember you used to kid me about leading you to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's why I'd like to have you in the bank now. I still think you could lead us all to it. 
Just the way I thought your father could once. Uh, l- l- let's not get back into that, Uncle. Let's just open this mysterious envelope. Uh, well? Uh, no, it's just something he wants me to do. Is, is it a secret? Oh, no. Oh, well, he doesn't say. Sort of, I suppose. Well, not between us. Well, let me read it to you. Dear son, among all the things in our relationship which has made it the best of my life, was the fact we never questioned each other but accepted us on faith. So I ask a final act of faith with no questions asked. Please continue to issue a banker's check for $800 every month as indicated to the following address, Box 13, Branwell, County Meath, Ireland. That is all? (sighs) Yep. No name? No name. What for? No, no indication. Or how long he's been paying? Nope. And how much? Eight hundred dollars a month. Well, that's nearly ten thousand a year. Mm-hmm. You're not going to keep paying that out. Oh yes, Uncle F. I am. It was my father's wish. I'm living up to it. There's only one thing I'm not living up to. And that is? I'm not going to do it without a reason. Which means I can answer an earlier question of yours. I know what I am going to do with myself. I'm going to make a trip to Ireland. I'd like to know just who's picking up that check from Box 13, GPO, Bramwell, County Me. If I wasn't quite living up to my father's last request, I wasn't being completely honest with my uncle either. For there was a name, as well as an address. Boan Connor. So on the next plane, I left for Ireland and Branwell, wherever that turned out to be. Ah, the top of the evening to you, sir. What did it be? Oh, uh, I'll just have, um, uh, have you any uh, draft beer? Oh, that I have. Pride of County Meath. Would I be after drawing you one? Uh, yeah, I'll have a glass if you don't mind. Well, now, from the tone of your voice, you would not be from these parts. <laughs> America, is it? That's right, but I am of Irish descent. There's your draft, sir. Oh, thank you. And what brings you to Drumkerry? Drumkerry? I, I thought this was Branwell. Ah, well, so it is, so it is in a manner of speaking, or was, you see. Been all of 18 years since we used the old name. The old name? That's right, sir. Up till January 15th, 1922, then it got changed. A lot of things changed once we became the Irish Free State. You mean this town has been called Drumcarry since 1922? That's how it'd be, all right. Hmm. But if letters were mailed, uh, I mean posted to Branwell, they'd still be delivered. Oh, naturally. Even after all these years? Well, now, Lord bless you, sir. I've been postmaster here in the last 25, so I can assure you any letter sent here would find its way to its proper destination, whether it was to Branwell or Drumcarry. I see. Uh, why why did you change the name? Oh, I don't know. Superstition, maybe. Uh, not a very pleasant name, after all. Oh, seems pleasant enough to me. Well, that's because you wouldn't know Irish history, or, or a local history, for that matter. Uh, one reason or another, it's been a real curse, that old well. Well? W- w- what old well? Well, the one the town got its name from. Brand's well, do you ah, see, to begin with? Yes, there, there, there actually is... Well, oh yes, oh yes. Well, that is, there was, been capped up ever since you were uh, long enough ago. No need for it once the water supply was brought in. Folks weren't using it anyway. What with its history. But uh, what happened to the well? Did it go bad? Ah, from bad to worse. Though it was never any good in the first place, to my mind. Not after, as they say, Bran took it for his living place. Now, who was Bran? Oh, you never heard of him, weren't well, sure. It is not surprising, since he was Sassanach, and you being of Irish descent. A Sassanach? A British man, oh. British. He belonged to them, and we never asked any part of him. But they chased him out of Wales. And it was an ill wind ever blew him west to swim the Irish Sea and up the Boyne till he found our subterranean caves under the mountains there. <laughs> this man swam across the Irish Sea? Ah, not man, sir. Sure, he was more than man. A, a bogle or a god or whatever you'd like to call him. And evil as a hoodie crow or a raven. 
called docile he was, so no ship or house could hold him, and his heart black as the pits of hell. My grandfather himself told me that the well was brackish enough already in his time. And to be sure, I... I always thought it tasted like bog water myself. <laughs> but no matter, no matter. They finally had to cap it after there was one too many. Uh, one too many what? Ah, well, sure. Why should I be bothering you with local gossip and old wives' tales? Uh, have another brew on the house. Oh, that's very kind of you, sir. Well, it's getting late. I, I have to find some lodgings. Uh, uh, do, you, do you also have an inn here? No, I'm afraid not. What is it? How long would you want to be staying? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm i a writer, and I wanted to get some background and local color. Uh, well, could you suggest somewhere I might find a room? No, I might just be able to do that, for I see someone coming down the road would be just the answer. To... Uh, who? Boan Connard. <laughs> Boan Connard? Where is he? He? Well, sure, what is the matter with you at all? Boan is a lady's name. And there she is herself, if you look out the window. On her way here, bless her heart. Ah, sure, it's the lonely, brave soul she is in a hard, long life she lives, taken in borders to make ends meet. Hey, well, could, uh, c- come out now. We'll meet her by the stoop. God save you, Mrs. Kennard. Where are you off so late in the evening in such a hurry? I had a call then, Mr. Muldoon, did you see? Oh, a call, was it? And and from where at all? On the telephone? Ah, sure, you know, I don't have such an instrument in the house. From the voices. No, no, there, tis a might early for the little folks to be about yet. Ah, stop your nonsense, Sean Muldoon. I don't hold with flippery the like of that. <laughs> I have my own voices, and they serve me well. Was there something for me in the post, then? Ah, no, sure not even one of them advertisements. Number 13 is as bare as the old woman's cupboard. Ah, but I heard it so clear. Well, maybe you did, after all. For for here's a gentleman, a writer and all, is looking for lodging for a while. And twas in my mind that you might want to take him in. Uh, it, it'd only be for a couple of weeks, Mrs. Connaught. I'm willing to pay anything within reason. You're from the state. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I should introduce myself. My name is Patrick Kinsella. Well, now, there's a fine Irish name for you, eh? <laughs> is it not? Kinsella. Patrick? Uh, well, the full name is Michael Patrick Kinsella. Ah, uh, that'll be it. The room will be ten and six a day with breakfast. Eighteen shillings with full board. No reduction by the week or month. It's just by the day. Well, oh, that'll be fine. Uh, now, let me see. I uh, suppose I pay you uh, two weeks in advance? Have your luggage. Uh, it's in my car outside. Uh, come along, I'll drive, and you direct me where to go. I had the strangest sense that I'd stepped across a border into a dream fantasy world. We drove a short distance and over a bridge. And then, at her direction, I turned down a hill and onto a cobblestone road to stop in a courtyard paved the same way. Next to a round structure, about waist high, that was roofed over by some heavy oaken timbers dovetailed together and shaped to fit like a lid. Is, um, is, is, is that a well? What else? That's Bran's well. The one that's never used anymore. The one that was fouled forever. As well you know. What do you mean, as well I know? Who would know better? Now, I want to know something. (laughs) What? Why did you come back, Michael? Why did you ever come back? For the moment, Pat Kinsella can only stare, open-mouthed, at the tiny woman who is suddenly all blazing eyes, burning with accusation. He realizes, of course, that he is being mistaken for his father. It isn't the first time people have noted the resemblance. But what fascinates and repels him is a secret that seems about to be revealed. A secret he is not sure he wants to know. I shall return shortly with Act Two. (laughs) 
So here is Michael Patrick Kinsella in the year 1940, sitting in a car next to a little wisp of a woman who, for some inexplicable reason, his dead father has been supporting for over 20 years, secretly. And next to a well that has been capped and shut tight against what? The legends of the enormous demigod who lives far below in its subterranean caverns? Always hungry for the sacrifice of a human soul? For some more practical reason, that the water is fouled, or the well has outlived its usefulness. I'm afraid you're making a mistake, Miss Connaught. I'm not who you seem to think I am. Ah, uh, never fear a whisk, lad. You're just who you have to be. Yes, but my name isn't Michael. I mean, that's not what I'm called by. It's Pat. It's a long time, do you know? And who remembers all the names the way they can change with the passing years? You're still the one expected, are you not? Expected? The voice was after telling me you'd be back. Did you not hear it yourself? The voice? What else would you call it? You'll not be telling me it didn't call you then. Else why are you here again? Well, I'm not here again. Ah, there now. It had to be. Such an important anniversary. Twenty-one years. You had to be here. Here for what? To strike off the chains, set the soul at liberty to rest in peace. Uh, Miss Connaught, forgive me, but I, I really don't know what you're talking about. Do you not, Michael? I'm not Michael. I'm Pat. Michael was my father. Ah, is it so? That might account for it then. Ah, but here, tis late it's coming on to be, and you could be tired and have a good meal is what you need under your belt. We'll leave the car here and walk to the house, and I'll get you settled in again. Again? You'll see. Once you're in the house, and it all begins to come back. I didn't really want to get out of the car into the Irish gloaming, that peculiar half-light between day and dark that lasts so long. But grabbing my bags, I dutifully followed the tiny figure of my hostess as she clumped doggedly, but yet with a kind of grace down the path to a small thatched cottage with thick stone walls. Inside, she lit kerosene lamps and bustled about, getting me settled in an upstairs room with a dormer window poking through the thatch and overlooking the well. Do you remember now? Uh, why can't I make you understand? There's nothing to remember. All I'm here ah, for... Ah, you can't deny that bed. And the well outside the window. And that here, it was the wedding night. Or so I thought, heaven save me. What are you trying to tell me, Miss Connor? That my father was here? What was it you said, 21 years ago? Come here to the light now. And let me look at you, boy. Oh, carefully. I may look like my father, or rather like he did, but I am my own man. You're his spitting image if you're not. I couldn't be my father under any circumstances. Because he's dead. God defend us. He's away to the other world then, and abandoned the girl he shamed. So that's why you were called. I wasn't called. I came here to find out who the mysterious Boan Connor was and why my father was paying... was paying you all that money. But maybe it would be better if I left. You want to run away without finding out. I don't think I want to find out anymore. Why, boy? Because you think I'm an old lady touched in the head. I didn't say that. But it was in your mind, for sure. Because these old eyes are dim... And I thought I saw himself raised up from the past and come to make us whole. You see now that I'm the son and not the father. More is the pity, for now indeed we're lost. And there's no more waiting this side of the curtain. It is all too late, and the shame must burn itself into eternity. My life is done. Miss Connaught, let me be honest. If my father deserted you or walked out on you sometime in the past, I, I, I'm sorry. But it looks at least as if he's tried to pay his debt. Walked out on me? 
Sweet Mary, look down on us. Twas not me he walked out on. Twas... There, now. It's the storm. It's been threatening all day. What I had to say will have to wait. Why? With the wind away to the northwest, the rain oft blows down the chimney. I'll have to set the damper down. And there are windows to be closed. I'll call you when I'm ready. This would have been my moment to pick up my heels and run. My last chance. But I had waited too long. I went to the window, peering out through the streaming rain that blurred the window panes. For one breath-catching moment, I thought I saw the lid on the well lift, as though some strange creature was about to answer the knocking of the raindrops on his door. And then suddenly it was too dark to see any more. By the middle of dinner, the rain was gone. And by the end of it, Miss Connaught was too. I had tried to question her, but she refused to talk until I'd eaten. And now she seemed to have disappeared into thin air. Suddenly, I wasn't mystified anymore, or apprehensive, or afflicted by any form of ESP. I was just plain angry, and I wanted out. I packed my bags, slung them in the car, headed out of the cobblestone yard and along the road to the bridge. But that's as far as I was going. It was a wash, a foot under the swiftly flowing river. All right, just a minute, I'll roll it down. What are you looking for me? No, Miss Connaught, frankly, I was taking a powder. A what? I thought you had run out on me, so I decided to run out too. I will not run very far this night. The bridge is underwater, and the river isn't even crested yet. If we get more rain tonight, we're in for flood. Uh, You'll not get across very soon, boy. All right, then. Climb in. I'll take you back to the house. Looks like we're fated to open some graves. It wasn't me your father deserted. It was me younger sister, Deirdre. I never heard my father mention that name. Well, I'm sure of that. He didn't dare. Why not? Your father was weak. He wasn't a bad man, just a, a weak one. It was the spring of 1918 in Paris that Deirdre met up with Michael on what they call the left bank, down by the river Seine. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I, I mean, uh, oh, um, pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle. <laughs> I'm not French. Oh, well, I, I was just trying to say I, I, I didn't know anyone was down here. Well... Now you know. Yes. Um, are, are, are you alone? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess you uh, want to stay alone, so... Uh, well, I'll just... Uh... Hey, uh, listen. C- couldn't we just um, talk a few minutes? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I don't speak French, so I don't get to talk to many girls. <laughs> well, that's funny now, is it not? Here I speak English, but I don't get to do much talking uh, in a social way with the English soldiers. Oh, no, I, I'm not English. I, I'm American. Ah, so I hear. And you are not English. You're Irish. <laughs> I can hear that. And if I am? You know, I'm, I'm Irish, too. No, I mean, three generations ah, back. Ah, are you now? And where do you live in the States? Boston. There's almost as many of us there as there are in Dublin. Ah, is that a fact? And you're here to save us all and to be a soldier, boy. <laughs> I'm here to help beat the Kaiser and save my skin if I can. I, uh, I'm not much for war. Ah, nor me. That's why I'm down here now looking at the river tonight, trying to forget another one, a special one who died tonight. Your, uh, your fiancé? No. Boyfriend? No. Any more than they're all that. The poor hurt darling. No, I'm a nurse, you see. Oh, well, not a real nurse, not an RN, just a helper. Like me. 
Uh, oh, uh, uh, my, my name is uh, Michael Kinsella. Well, how do you do? Uh, I'm Deirdre Connors. Hello, Deirdre. Hello, Michael. <laughs> I, uh, I never called a girl by her first name that fast before. Now me a boy. You're a fast worker, <laughs> Michael Kinsella. <laughs> Only because I've never really been in love before. What? At first sight. Don't you feel any way the same? It's a shame I should be to admit it. But the trouble is, I do. That's the way they met. And for the most of that year, they were seldom separated. It was just sheer luck that Michael was assigned to the quartermaster's staff in Paris and never saw any action. The war was just a sort of holiday to him until the day he was assigned to return home and he had to face the truth at last. But you can't just leave me behind. Not now. Not the way I am. It's all right, darling. I've gotten a leave. I'm going to see you home. Home? As far as London, anyway. Now, the way it is, I have to go there on business, so the hotel reservation has been made. We can try to work it all out then. Work, work what out? What we're going to do. I mean, how it's going to end. End? It, 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 it has to, Dee. Ah, oh, there's no excuse. I know I, I should have told you from the very beginning, but... Well, it's over for us. Why? Because I can't ever marry you. I'm married already. You're married? To someone else? Yes. But you can't be. Mike, you, you can't. I'm having your child. What am I going to do? It's, it's all right, darling. You won't ever have to worry. I, I'll support him and you, I promise. But look, when we get to London, everything will be arranged legally. Legally? But what can be legal? There's nothing I can do now. Neither of us believe in divorce, and besides, it's out of the question. Why? Well, my whole position with the bank, my future in business is because I married my wife. Her father owns the bank and half of Boston, for that matter. They cut me loose. I couldn't support myself, let alone you and and the child that's coming. So, you're giving me one who's to have no father. But that wasn't the way it turned out at all. Because when they got to London, Deirdre was ready to go into labor. And what faced them there was enough to bring it on full force. What faced them, Miss Connor? What would you guess? Mrs. Patrick Kinsella. The woman from whom your father would have done anything to hide his affair with Deirdre. My mother. Your father's wife. Quite suddenly, our story has moved from the world of fantasy to a world of quite sordid reality. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. imagine what happened in the scene when Michael Kinsella and Deidre Connaught, already seven months pregnant, unexpectedly had to face Michael's wife. There was no longer any chance for subterfuge. Everything was out in the open. And at last, our story has reached the moment when the past is about to be revealed, and Michael's son, Pat, is going to learn a buried truth that will shake him to his heels. But what was my mother doing in London? Mrs. Kinsella? Well... Sure, she knew the hotel had been engaged in London for business. And didn't her father offer her the trip across the ocean to greet her husband that much earlier? But didn't my father know she was coming? I suppose Mrs. Kinsella thought to give him a happy surprise. Oh, it was a surprise, no doubt of that. But far from a happy one. To begin with, that is. Well, what do you mean, to begin with? Well, first off, it was a terrible shock for Deirdre. And the baby was born out of its time. Dead? Oh, no. Before his time. But alive and kicking and screaming and ready to hang on to life. There was no easy way, do you see, out of it all. Or so it seemed. What are you trying to tell me? 
Did you never wonder why you never had any brothers or sisters at all? Well, of course. I suppose every only child does. Well, you'll not have to wonder any longer when I tell you that the one you've thought your mother all this time never could have a child in this or any world. And well, she and your father knew it before they were ever married. You mean that I am that baby? What chance had a child born outside the church for a life here in Ireland? Against the future for him in America, oh, not to mention the miracle it was for a barren woman to be given the gift of motherhood. But no one ever guessed. Why should they? The one you thought your mother had said farewell to her husband only seven months before. She'd been waiting a month in London, and it was weeks before she left the sail over. You were born early. And it was easy to bring the time into joint with all the red tape of mustering out your father in England instead of America and the holiday they pretended to take in Europe after. By the time the three of you got back to America, there was no one to question. It was her having a baby that had delayed their return. Except you. And my real mother. Only you were safe, weren't you? You'd been bought off. I was paid for and delivered. I wished not so fast. If I'd realized then what I did later, I would never have stood for it. Your father brought your mother home to this house here in Drumkerry after you were born to sleep here in this same room as you're sleeping in tonight. And when my father left? I thought he would be back. But he never came. He never came. And my mother? Your mother. What was there left? For her to live for. Betrayed by the man she loved more than life itself. Without her baby to give her a reason for living. I still say she didn't have to sell me. It's a long time ago, Patrick, then. And a different world it was. She thought to do it for your sake. Oh, many's the time she regretted her decision. But it was too late to change her mind. She could only hurt three other people. Your father... And his wife and yourself by recalling it. And maybe in the long run herself too. For there was nothing at all to keep life together in a roof between her and the wind and the rain. But the money from America. Bitter ashes. In the end, what did it matter? Her life was over. So she... She went away. She went away? Where? They do say that Bran lives in the caverns beneath the old well out there. And every generation he claims a life in sacrifice. Come on, Miss Connor. Don't give me old country superstitions. Answer me. The well is fed by the River Boyne through caverns that wander deep in the earth through solid rock. She was not the first to step into Bran's well and drop into eternity. And that's how my... how my mother died? It's how she tried to die. Now, what are you saying? You are of the faith, are you not? Yes, I... Yes. And what hope of salvation would a woman twice damned have? A child out of wedlock? Only your father's coming back and setting that straight might have saved her. He couldn't do that. I mean, even if he hadn't been, as you said, weak, his, his own religion... She knew that. So, lost already, she was ready to commit the other mortal sin and take her own life. Now she knows no rest. Her body was never found. No. She was never buried. There was no service. She died in sin and is left to Rome seeking forgiveness with the one who might have brought her peace, dead himself. Well, there it is now. And the storm looks to be coming back. Oh, I am so tired. And you must be too. Let's away to bed and find some rest, if we can. I don't suppose I've ever felt more tired in my life. My mind churned with all the revelations I had. 
But underneath it all, as I tossed and turned while the thunder growled in the background, was that strange sense of inner vision I had wrestled with since childhood. The unexplained knowledge of events, future and past, that had haunted me all my life. And in this turmoil, I fell asleep. I was startled by an enormous thunderclap, followed by the wrenching split of wood. It brought me bolt upright and in one bound to the window. Where? In the courtyard below. In the flash of the lightning, I could see that the oaken cap over the well gaped open. And through the sudden curtain of rain, I could only half see emerging from the shattered split in the wood. A strange, ephemeral presence. The last huge clap of thunder drove me inexorably downstairs and out into the rain and towards the well. Behind. Are you all right? Of course. You're, you're, you're getting soaked. So are you. Well, well, that doesn't matter. Come, we, we should go into the house. Should we? Why? Well, well, it's crazy to stay out in a storm like this. Does that bother you? Let's stop it. The, the rain stopped. The, the, the thunder's gone. The, the moon is shining. What happened? You asked for it. I gave it to you. Who are you? You must know by now. Deirdre. Yes. But, but you're dead. Oh, how I wish I were. I'm only passed over. What? I can't be dead, you see. Not yet. Not till... I'm waiting. Waiting. Waiting? For what? For him to come. Who? Him. The one to release me. The one to let me sleep at last. He is dead. My father is dead. I know. But he can't save me. Only you can. Why me? Because you are the one who has been wronged. Only you can forgive. (laughs) Why should I? When you sold me. I wanted a better life than I could offer you. The money was not my idea, but your father's. I never spent a penny of it. It's all saved up against the day of your coming here, as I knew you would. It will be yours now, and you will be independent now, and free, in a way Michael never was. Ooh, it's near the dawn. And my time is running out. Patrick, darling, my son, don't turn your back on me as your father did. Please. Mother. Mother, it... It's too late. I never knew your love, not as a child. How can I find it now when you are dead and in the grave? Give me yours now. And you will find my love. Set me free. And I'll come to you. In good time. You will see. Mother, I... I forgive you. I forgive you with all my heart. Then my bonds are broken. And I can go meet your father. As my newborn self. In this other life. Look for me, my darling. Look for me. I will come to you at last. And will bring you all the love you have missed. I came awake. My head ringing with the force of the thunderclap. I rushed to the window. Even through the streaming rain, I could see the well. The cap was unbroken, in place. But how could that be? I had seen it split in two. Could all that have been a dream? The first light of day was banishing the storm. And suddenly, I had a premonition. 
I searched through the house for Miss Connaught. I found her sitting in an easy chair in the living room. A small, seamed face, smoothed of wrinkles. A smile on her lips. Her eyes closed. And a locket on a chain resting in her hands. She was quite dead. She must have been dead for some time. I dressed hurriedly and drove to the village. So, poor little Boan Connaught has gone at last. Ah, well, tis a blessing. Little she had to live for and all without a man ever. Mr. Muldoon, the well. Miss Connaught had that cat, didn't she? Ah, no, indeed, that was the town. There were too many young Colleen's over the years stepping off its coffin. And the last one was just too much. Miss Connaught's sister, Deirdre? Sister? Boan Deirdre Connaught? Sure she never had a sister in this life. Single she was. And half the boys in the county after her. Till she came back from Paris, France in the first war. And never another man would she give the time of day to from that time till now. Now that she's in her grave. So there it was. I suppose I should have guessed it all along. That sad little lady was Deirdre Connaught, the mother I never knew. And all that love unspent between us. But somehow I'm not sad. I open the locket, and there is a picture there of her as she must have been when she was young. Tousled red hair and sea green eyes dancing with impish merriment. And I know that somewhere in the future she is to come to me again. And this time we will live out our years together. I'm as sure of it as I am of my own name. A footnote. Shortly after Pat Kinsella returned to America came the disaster of Pearl Harbor. He enlisted immediately and fought with distinction through all of World War II. In the summer of 1945, after VE Day, his first night in Paris, he went to the left bank of the Seine, retracing his father's footsteps down the steps to the wharf. Did he know in some mystic way that he would find there the young nurse whom he would marry? They are still living happily ever afterwards. I'll be back shortly. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. I'll see you soon on the podcast. Good evening.